part one. You will hear three different extracts. For questions one to six, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract one. Pessimism is deeply ingrained in the British psyche. Pessimism is the natural British condition. There's nothing we relish so much as some bad news. Pessimists never expect their holiday plans to run to schedule. When the plane is delayed at the airport, they sigh. Oh, I knew this would happen. When their bags go missing, they accept the loss with stoicism, reasoning, "It had to be me." Our administrators are forever being pressed to disclose their contingency plans and Plan B. Plan A is never expected to succeed. This national trait starts in childhood with the Christopher Robin stories. Eeyore, the pessimistic donkey who's always certain his tail will fall off, appeals immediately to the young British reader. He connects with our melancholy, phlegmatic side. Irony, on which so much distinctive British humour is based, has pessimism as its prime ingredient. It thinks the worst. Pessimism is deeply ingrained in the British psyche. Pessimism is the natural British condition. There's nothing we relish so much as some bad news. Pessimists never expect their holiday plans to run to schedule. When the plane is delayed at the airport, they sigh. Oh, I knew this would happen. When their bags go missing, they accept the loss with stoicism, reasoning, "It had to be me." Our administrators are forever being pressed to disclose their contingency plans and Plan B. Plan A is never expected to succeed. This national trait starts in childhood with the Christopher Robin stories. Eeyore, the pessimistic donkey who's always certain his tail will fall off, appeals immediately to the young British reader. He connects with our melancholy, phlegmatic side. Irony, on which so much distinctive British humour is based, has pessimism as its prime ingredient. It thinks the worst. Extract two. We are all living in the past. The idea of now is an illusion. The discovery, reported by a team of scientists, has the bizarre consequence that your brain is collecting information about the future of an event before it puts together what it thinks it saw at the time of the event. Our brains seem to work in a similar way to the slightly delayed broadcast of live TV shows. To provide an opportunity for fast editing changes, the delay with which our brains process visual information has now been measured by scientists, providing new insights into how we use vision to make sense of the world. Human perception of the outside world seems to be delayed by a minimum of eighty thousandths of a second. This is comparative to live television, which can be broadcast after a delay of about three seconds to allow for editing. What you think you're seeing at any given moment is actually influenced by events in the near future, the scientists say in their report. They used a technique called the flash lag phenomenon, which acts as a visual illusion to the brain. They discovered that human brains seem to develop conscious awareness in an after-the-fact fashion, analyzing information from both before and after an event before committing to a decision about what happened. We are all living in the past. The idea of now is an illusion. The discovery, reported by a team of scientists, has the bizarre consequence that your brain is collecting information about the future of an event before it puts together what it thinks it saw at the time of the event. Our brains seem to work in a similar way to the slightly delayed broadcast of live TV shows to provide an opportunity for fast editing changes. 
The delay with which our brains process visual information has now been measured by scientists, providing new insights into how we use vision to make sense of the world. Human perception of the outside world seems to be delayed by a minimum of eighty thousandths of a second. This is comparative to live television, which can be broadcast after a delay of about three seconds to allow for editing. What you think you're seeing at any given moment is actually influenced by events in the near future, the scientists say in their report. They used a technique called the flash lag phenomenon, which acts as a visual illusion to the brain. They discovered that human brains seem to develop conscious awareness in an after-the-fact fashion, analyzing information from both before and after an event, before committing to a decision about what happened. Extract three. Thomas Edison, the doyen of inventors, said it first. No sooner does a fellow succeed in making a good thing than some other fellows pop up and tell you they did it years ago. His rueful observation reflects the fact that anyone who has a good idea will run into soon enough. That creativity is such a precious commodity that when even a tiny bit of it appears, people instantly want to lay claim to it. For most of recorded history, having a bright idea was no protection against being ripped off by the unscrupulous. It's not a whole lot better now, but there is something that, in theory at least, makes sure that the credit and the money for the invention go where they are due. Patents. The earliest known English patent was granted to John of Utinam, a Flemish stained glass maker in 1449. John received the same privilege as those granted an English patent do to this day, a twenty-year monopoly to exploit the fruit of his ingenuity. In return, he was required to teach his process to native Englishmen. That too is still part of the philosophy behind the modern patent. That it doesn't just encourage innovation, but also the spread of that innovation. Inventors don't actually have to hold classes to teach everyone else how to make what they've invented, but they do have to disclose how to do it. And what trouble that has caused ever since! For by revealing exactly what you have done and how, you're putting your intellectual jewels right where other people can get them. Not only that, but by stating what is new about your invention. You are revealing your likely marketing strategy. Thomas Edison, the doyen of inventors, said it first. No sooner does a fellow succeed in making a good thing than some other fellows pop up and tell you they did it years ago. His rueful observation reflects the fact that anyone who has a good idea will run into soon enough that creativity is such a precious commodity that when even a tiny bit of it appears. People instantly want to lay claim to it. For most of recorded history, having a bright idea was no protection against being ripped off by the unscrupulous. It's not a whole lot better now, but there is something that, in theory at least, makes sure that the credit and the money for the invention go where they are due. Patents. The earliest known English patent was granted to John of Utinam, a Flemish stained glass maker, in 1449. John received the same privilege as those granted an English patent do to this day, a twenty-year monopoly to exploit the fruit of his ingenuity. In return, he was required to teach his process to native Englishmen. That too is still part of the philosophy behind the modern patent, that it doesn't just encourage innovation, but also the spread of that innovation. Inventors don't actually have to hold classes to teach everyone else how to make what they've invented. But they do have to disclose how to do it, and what trouble that has caused ever since. For by revealing exactly what you have done and how, you're putting your intellectual jewels right where other people can get them. Not only that, but by stating what is new about your invention, you are revealing your likely marketing strategy. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You will hear a radio report about interactive science and technology centres in Britain.
For questions 7 to 15, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds in which to look at part 2. It's more interesting than I expected. I shall come here again, said nine-year-old James Stimson, who had been enjoying himself at the National Stone Centre in Derbyshire on the day when I went there. He had just seen the fossilised remains of a brachiopod, a prehistoric sea animal that predated the dinosaurs by 120 million years, one of a series of fossils found in a rock face in what... 330 million years ago, was part of the coast of Derbyshire, then comprising tropical lagoons and small islands. The area was part of a huge upland which, from medieval times, has been mined for lead and limestone and now hosts school parties and other groups. The centre has been created from six worked-out stone quarries. One fascinating fact that visitors to it learn is that we each consume six to seven tonnes of stone a year. James couldn't believe his eyes when he read this on a display board inside the centre's discovery building. What? We eat stone? he asked. Well, not exactly. What the display shows is that we use stone in everything from paint to computers to ceiling tiles. 90% of the stone we use is in construction, in everything from tunnels to tennis courts. But stone is also used in plastics, so you will find it in cars, ships and planes. And as it is also used in producing sugar, flour, pharmaceuticals and poultry feed, we all eat a certain amount of stone. James and some friends in his party moved on to attempt panning gems from mineral fragments. Others followed the site's history, ecology and geography trails. I spoke to James's headmaster, Michael Halls of Turnditch Primary School near Derby, who was accompanying the group. He told me that the National Stone Centre is a splendid teaching resource. It helps teachers to teach children all sorts of skills, from observation and looking behind the obvious, to hands-on activities, such as dry stone wall building and making plaster casts of fossils. He told me that it also helps children to appreciate what a changing world we live in. Furthermore, many of the activities there fit perfectly into the national curriculum. Although for the children, it's more like an exciting outing than a lesson. That sums up the philosophy of Britain's 25 or so interactive science and technology centres, built on the foundation of Launchpad, the first interactive gallery at the Science Museum in South Kensington, London, which was opened in 1985. I visited another example. On the site of three disused dry docks in Tiger Bay, Cardiff, Wales, a £7 million temple to science and technology called TechniQuest has been built. It houses 160 exhibits and science interactives, experiments which people of all ages can try out for themselves. The complex incorporates a 35-seat planetarium, a 100-seater science theatre, a science shop, workshop and galleries. The success of TechniQuest has been based on experiments involving liquids that you can cut, bubbles you can walk inside and structures that roll uphill and a philosophy against the don't-touch exhibits of traditional museums. 
The centre started from the premise that it wanted to change people's attitudes towards science and technology. And the idea is that people of all ages have to use all their senses to discover the fun of finding out about science and technology. At TechniQuest, you are as likely to see a granny as an eight-year-old swivelling around under discreet supervision in a specially adapted dentist's chair to experience the pull of centrifugal force. Or people making odd sounds down a 15-metre-long steel tube to observe how sound waves can clash and distort one another. The favourite exhibition is Puff the Pneumatic Dragon, a huge steel creation in Welsh green and red, whose tongue, wings, and claws respond instantly to the fingertip controls of visitors. Puff's arteries, the hydraulic tubes and electronic circuits that make him respond, are laid out for all to see. It may not be a formal lesson in control systems, but you cannot fail to learn. And that is true of all the interactive science and technology centres throughout the country. It's more interesting than I expected. I shall come here again," said nine-year-old James Stimson, who had been enjoying himself at the National Stone Centre in Derbyshire on the day when I went there. He had just seen the fossilised remains of a brachiopod, a prehistoric sea animal that predated the dinosaurs by 120 million years, one of a series of fossils found in a rock face in what 330 million years ago. Was part of the coast of Derbyshire, then comprising tropical lagoons and small islands. The area was part of a huge upland which, from medieval times, has been mined for lead and limestone, and now hosts school parties and other groups. The centre has been created from six worked-out stone quarries. One fascinating fact that visitors to it learn is that we each consume six to seven tons of stone a year. James couldn't believe his eyes when he read this on a display board inside the centre's discovery building. What? We eat stone? He asked. Well, not exactly. What the display shows is that we use stone in everything, from paint to computers to ceiling tiles. Ninety percent of the stone we use is in construction, in everything from tunnels to tennis courts. But stone is also used in plastics, so you will find it in cars, ships, and planes. And as it is also used in producing sugar, flour, pharmaceuticals, and poultry feed, we all eat a certain amount of stone. James and some friends in his party. Moved on to attempt panning gems from mineral fragments. Others followed the site's history, ecology, and geography trails. I spoke to James's headmaster, Michael Halls of Turnditch Primary School near Derby, who was accompanying the group. He told me that the National Stone Centre is a splendid teaching resource. It helps teachers to teach children all sorts of skills, from observation and looking behind the obvious to hands-on activities such as dry stone wall building and making plaster casts of fossils. He told me that it also helps children to appreciate what a changing world we live in. Furthermore, many of the activities there fit perfectly into the national curriculum. Although for the children, it's more like an exciting outing than a lesson. That sums up the philosophy of Britain's 25 or so interactive science and technology centres, built on the foundation of Launchpad, the first interactive gallery at the Science Museum in South Kensington, London, which was opened in 1985. I visited another example. On the site of three disused dry docks in Tiger Bay, Cardiff, Wales, a seven million pound temple to science and technology called TechniQuest has been built. It houses 160 exhibits and science interactives, experiments which people of all ages can try out for themselves. 
The complex incorporates a 35-seat planetarium, a 100-seater science theater, a science shop, workshop, and galleries. The success of TechniQuest has been based on experiments involving liquids that you can cut, bubbles you can walk inside, and structures that roll uphill, and a philosophy against the "don't touch" exhibits of traditional museums. The center started from the premise that it wanted to change people's attitudes towards science and technology, and the idea is that people of all ages have to use all their senses to discover the fun of finding out about science and technology. At TechniQuest, you are as likely to see a granny as an eight-year-old swiveling around under discreet supervision in a specially adapted dentist's chair to experience the pull of centrifugal force, or people making odd sounds down a 15-meter-long steel tube to observe how sound waves can clash and distort one another. The favorite exhibition is Puff the Pneumatic Dragon. A huge steel creation in Welsh green and red, whose tongue, wings, and claws respond instantly to the fingertip controls of visitors. Puff's arteries, the hydraulic tubes and electronic circuits that make him respond, are laid out for all to see. It may not be a formal lesson in control systems, but you cannot fail to learn. And that is true of all the interactive science and technology centres throughout the country. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You will hear an interview with someone who reviews hotels. For questions sixteen to twenty, choose the answer A. B, C, or D, which fits best according to what you hear. You now have one minute in which to look at part three. I'm talking to Paddy Burt, who has a weekly hotel review column in a national newspaper, and who has just compiled a collection of those reviews for a forthcoming book. Paddy, when you go to a hotel to review it, what's your attitude? I always have high hopes. I、uh, bet this one's going to be good feeling, but you never can tell. Hotels that look so idyllic in one of the guides can be a terrible letdown, which is why readers who say they enjoy the column invariably add. Particularly the bad ones. For example, I recently got this letter from a reader who says, "It used to be every other week that you gave some poor hotelier a bashing. Now it's a rare treat to read about one you've been severely critical of, and that's a pity, since I love it when you lay into a pretentious but bad one." Of course, it's helpful when you recommend a good hotel, but for entertainment's sake. Do try to find some awful ones too. <laughs> so, are you always aiming to find fault? Are you glad when you find something you can be critical of? <laughs> I don't have to try. And while I'm always happy to slam into any pretentious hotel that doesn't come up to scratch, it's a different matter when the people are nice and the hotel isn't. I still have to write about it, and sometimes it hurts. Hotel keeping, it has been said, is akin to show business, and in the ones I like best, there is always a leading man or woman who is sometimes so good I think he or she has missed their true vocation. Such hoteliers usually have a sense of humour.
They may not like what I have written about them, but will respond in a good-humoured way. They are professionals. Many of them have become friends. What kind of hotels do you prefer? Is it possible to generalise about that? Well, I admit I have a penchant for owner-run hotels. They're more personal than the chains. With a few exceptions, I like the owners of small hotels, which is why I've had such fun researching my book of review pieces that have appeared in the newspaper, calling them if they haven't responded to the questionnaire I sent them, and either telling them who I am, or if I think they're going to shout at me, pretending to be the assistant I haven't got, Emily. <laughs> she didn't give us a very good review, did she? Some said. Well, no, but maybe they have since made improvements and would like people to know about them. Thus encouraged, the majority of these hoteliers have entered not just into the book, but into the spirit, and have contributed interesting behind-the-scenes stories. So some of the hotels you reviewed and wanted to put in the book haven't been included. Mm, that's right. There's one, for example, where the owner said, "I recorded all the calls." After insulting us and lying in her article, there is no way we would help her perpetuate her grievances against the world in a publication. <sighs> to specify the lies, he pounced on a remark I had made expressing surprise on being served certain vegetables in his restaurant. She doesn't understand proper food, he said. I was enthusiastic about it, actually, and if he wasn't so disagreeable, I would have liked to include his hotel in the book. On and on he went. Since her visit, we've noticed that a lot of people read her articles and then cross hotels off their potential list as a result of what she's said. They then go to hotels where she's been fawned over, and where they probably won't be fawned over. We've also noticed she prefers staying in hotels that are almost empty because that's when they have time to make a fuss of her. <laughs> Actually, being fawned over is the last thing that I want. So your column can provoke quite a reaction, then. Oh yes, in fact, the same owner also said, after she stayed here, we had four hotels asking for a description. They wanted to know what car she was driving and what credit card she had. Unfortunately, we couldn't give a description because she's fairly nondescript. <laughs> <laughs> But the peculiar thing is that when it finally clicked that being in the book wasn't going to cost him a penny, he said he wanted to be included. Maybe it was because he remembered that I had remarked on his resemblance to a much-loved comedian, sadly now dead. I declined his kind offer. I can see why, Paddy Burt. Thanks for talking to me. I'm talking to Paddy Burt, who has a weekly hotel review column in a national newspaper, and who has just compiled a collection of those reviews for a forthcoming book. Paddy, when you go to a hotel to review it. What's your attitude? I always have high hopes. I、uh, bet this one's going to be good feeling, but you never can tell. Hotels that look so idyllic in one of the guides can be a terrible letdown, which is why readers who say they enjoy the column invariably add, particularly the bad ones. For example, I recently got this letter from a reader who says, "It used to be every other week that you gave some poor hotelier a bashing." Now it's a rare treat to read about one you've been severely critical of, and that's a pity since I love it when you lay into a pretentious but bad one. Of course, it's helpful when you recommend a good hotel, but for entertainment's sake, do try to find some awful ones too. <laughs> so, are you always aiming to find fault? Are you glad when you find something you can be critical of? <laughs> I don't have to try. And while I'm always happy to slam into any pretentious hotel that doesn't come up to scratch, it's a different matter when the people are nice and the hotel isn't. I still have to write about it, and sometimes it hurts. Hotel keeping, it has been said, is akin to show business, and in the ones I like best, there is always a leading man or woman who is sometimes so good I think he or she has missed their true vocation. Such hoteliers usually have a sense of humour. They may not like what I have written about them, but will respond in a good-humoured way. They are professionals. Many of them have become friends. What kind of hotels do you prefer? Is it possible to generalise about that? Well, I admit I have a penchant for owner-run hotels. They're more personal than the chains. With a few exceptions, I like the owners of small hotels.
which is why I've had such fun researching my book of review pieces that have appeared in the newspaper, calling them if they haven't responded to the questionnaire I sent them, and either telling them who I am, or, if I think they're going to shout at me, pretending to be the assistant I haven't got, Emily. <laughs> she didn't give us a very good review, did she? Some said. Well, no, but maybe they have since made improvements and would like people to know about them. Thus encouraged, the majority of these hoteliers have entered not just into the book, but into the spirit, and have contributed interesting behind-the-scenes stories. So some of the hotels you reviewed and wanted to put in the book haven't been included? Mm, that's right. There's one, for example, where the owner said, I recorded all the calls. After insulting us and lying in her article, there is no way we would help her perpetuate her grievances against the world in a publication. <laughs> To specify the lies, he pounced on a remark I had made expressing surprise on being served certain vegetables in his restaurant. She doesn't understand proper food, he said. I was enthusiastic about it, actually, and if he wasn't so disagreeable, I would have liked to include his hotel in the book. On and on he went. Since her visit, we've noticed that a lot of people read her articles and then cross hotels off their potential list as a result of what she's said. They then go to hotels where she's been fawned over and where they probably won't be fawned over. We've also noticed she prefers staying in hotels that are almost empty because that's when they have time to make a fuss of her. <laughs> Actually, being fawned over is the last thing that I want. So your column can provoke quite a reaction then? Oh, yes. In fact, the same owner also said... After she stayed here, we had four hotels asking for her description. They wanted to know what car she was driving and what credit card she had. Unfortunately, we couldn't give a description because she's fairly nondescript. <laughs> <laughs> But the peculiar thing is that when it finally clicked that being in the book wasn't going to cost him a penny, he said he wanted to be included. Maybe it was because he remembered that I had remarked on his resemblance to a much-loved comedian, sadly now dead. I declined his kind offer. I can see why. Paddy Burt, thanks for talking to me. That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. Part four consists of two tasks. You will hear five short extracts in which people are talking about leisure activities they take part in. Look at task one. For questions 21 to 25, choose from the list A to H what the leisure activity involves for the speaker. Now look at task 2. For questions 26 to 30, choose from the list A to H what each speaker particularly enjoys about the leisure activity. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. You now have 45 seconds in which to look at part four. Speaker 1. The key to it all is that we all get together every week, not just off and on, and that makes it a very nice fixture in my life. It's the social side that matters to me, being with that bunch of people. And we've now been doing that for quite some time, so it's a very established thing. Of course, we have serious discussions and there are important decisions that we have to agree on as a committee. But it's great fun too, and we all go back a long way now. They're some of my very best friends and it's great being with them. Speaker 2 It started off as just a bit of an interest, but gradually it began to take over and I started doing it instead of other things I used to do. 
I used to have a range of hobbies that I did from time to time, but all the others went out of the window once I got involved with this. Friends say I've become obsessed, but as far as I'm concerned, it's all time well spent, and I go into another world when I'm doing it. What I do to earn a living is satisfying, but it's also very demanding and exhausting, and this is a complete antidote to that. I switch off totally when I'm doing it. Speaker three. I think it's a very worthwhile cause, and I was very keen to get involved once I heard about it from someone at work. The organisation can't function without contributions to keep it going, and that's my part. I haven't got a lot of time to dedicate to it, so it's a question of being organised. I've got a list of people to contact, and I work through that bit by bit, sending out a few emails from time to time. It's not the biggest thing in the world to do, but it gives me the nice feeling that I'm making my own contribution to something that needs doing. Speaker four. Before I took this up, I could never have imagined getting up in public and doing such a thing, but now it comes naturally. I had to start from scratch. It was all totally new to me, but I'd always had a secret wish to learn how to do it, and finally I got round to it. I didn't find it all that hard, actually, and a bit of regular practice is all I need now. It's a tremendous joy to have got really good at something you haven't done before, and I'm so glad I finally decided to do it. Speaker five. Well, I've got some of the best equipment secondhand; otherwise, I couldn't have afforded it, and found a good venue. Putting on this kind of thing is easy if you have a clear idea of what you want to achieve. The things I put on aren't massive; they're for a small audience that wants to spend time among like-minded people who enjoy the same kind of thing. So, I book good people. And do a bit of publicity, and so far they've all been successful and just about viable financially too. The great thing is when people tell me at the end how much they've enjoyed it. <laughs> That makes it all worthwhile. Speaker one. The key to it all is that we all get together every week, not just off and on, and that makes it a very nice fixture in my life. It's the social side that matters to me, being with that bunch of people, and we've now been doing that for quite some time. So it's a very established thing. Of course, we have serious discussions, and there are important decisions that we have to agree on as a committee. But it's great fun too, and we all go back a long way now. They're some of my very best friends, and it's great being with them. Speaker two. It started off as just a bit of an interest, but gradually it began to take over, and I started doing it instead of other things I used to do. I used to have a range of hobbies that I did from time to time, but all the others went out of the window once I got involved with this. Friends say I've become obsessed, but as far as I'm concerned, it's all time well spent, and I go into another world when I'm doing it. What I do to earn a living is satisfying, but it's also very demanding and exhausting, and this is a complete antidote to that. I switch off totally when I'm doing it. Speaker three. I think it's a very worthwhile cause, and I was very keen to get involved once I heard about it from someone at work. The organisation can't function without contributions to keep it going, and that's my part. I haven't got a lot of time to dedicate to it, so it's a question of being organised. I've got a list of people to contact, and I work through that bit by bit, sending out a few emails from time to time. It's not the biggest thing in the world to do, but it gives me the nice feeling that I'm making my own contribution to something that needs doing. Speaker four. Before I took this up, I could never have imagined getting up in public and doing such a thing, but now it comes naturally. I had to start from scratch. It was all totally new to me, 
but I'd always had a secret wish to learn how to do it, and finally I got round to it. I didn't find it all that hard, actually, and a bit of regular practice is all I need now. It's a tremendous joy to have got really good at something you haven't done before, and I'm so glad I finally decided to do it. Speaker 5 Well, I've got some of the best equipment, second-hand, otherwise I couldn't have afforded it, and found a good venue. Putting on this kind of thing is easy if you have a clear idea of what you want to achieve. The things I put on aren't massive. They're for a small audience that wants to spend time among like-minded people who enjoy the same kind of thing. So I book good people and do a bit of publicity. And so far, they've all been successful and just about viable financially too. The great thing is when people tell me at the end how much they've enjoyed it. <laughs> that makes it all worthwhile. That is the end of part four. There will now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I shall remind you when there is one minute left, so that you are sure to finish in time. <laughs>